Father, we thank you uh, for this uh, gathering that uh, you've arranged today uh, here at the Bluestone Farms in Miller, Pennsylvania. Uh, this uh, tenth day of uh, Chungi, the uh, fifth month and the twelfth day of the Heavenly Calendar. And Father, we really want to uh, welcome your spirit here uh, so that you may guide us and so that you may guide the words that are spoken here. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, each and every person who is here uh, can open your, their hearts uh, to your word. Uh, we offer this report in the name of Timothy Elder and you know so God bless the Central family. Ha Ah, uh, Good evening everyone. Uh, I want to th first uh, thank uh, Greg for uh, arranging this uh, under Father's guidance and um, um, not quite sure how to how to begin uh, but um, uh, I think the fir I can begin with the first time that I actually uh, encountered Father or met Father. Uh, this was actually a little bit after I joined the church. I joined the church in uh, October of uh, 1974. I think it was October 17th or so, I think. Yeah, probably October 17th in uh, Berrytown. Uh, I just attended a three-day workshop that was uh, held over Columbus Day weekend and um, spent a couple days after that uh, sort of um, struggling over what I should do because I had a good job then and uh, uh, had a couple bank accounts and stuff like that but uh, a few days later I decided to to join and uh, to uh, quit my job and uh, and uh, be in the church full time. And the first time I encountered Father was about a week later on October 24th I think. Uh, that Father then was had uh, asked uh, members to fast for seven days uh, or I think for all members to fast seven days for uh, Korea because there was a very um, a difficult situation on the Korean Peninsula then uh, where um, I think the the United Nations was was considering a resolution to um, end the Korean War or or, or withdraw uh, the UN troops uh, from the Korean Peninsula or something like that Anyway, there was a, a serious uh, situation involving the security of uh, Korea. And so um, I and I think everybody else at, in Berrytown and a lot of other uh, members were, were um, fasting for seven days. And, and uh, I think on October 24th, uh, everyone in Berrytown was asked to go down to um, uh, the UN Plaza to uh, join a demonstration there. Uh, maybe other members from New York and elsewhere were already demonstrating there, but very time people were asked to go down on, on that specific day. But I was pulled aside because uh, uh, Berrytown was um, purchasing a fleet of vans and they needed uh, people to drive those vans. And uh, I, you know, a bunch of others were pulled aside to to participate in that, so we didn't go to the demonstration. So we, I, I did that uh, task and came back to Berrytown and and um, um, in the building there was there was probably no one there in the building I don't know where the other guys were who had been driving and where they went to but I went to the uh, room where all the there was one room for for all the for all the men and uh, just a, a whole bunch of, uh, of beds you know with the metal frames and mats and uh, in one wing of the of the uh, 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 of the building there, and I was sitting on my bed uh, reading the Divine Principle when um, I looked up and and Father walks in um, with a couple of people, and I guess he was taking advantage of the fact that no one is in Berrytown to come up and take a look at the improvements uh, or so because this was just a few months after Berrytown had been purchased, uh, and. Uh, uh, I was reading my divine, sitting on my bed, reading divine principle. I looked up, and there he is, and and uh, I didn't do anything. <laughs> and so he looked at me, and and uh, I think he said, probably in English, uh, study hard, or study a lot, or something like that. Study study a lot, or something like that. Uh, and then he left. He he was accompanied by one or two other people. 
I don't, I don't remember who they were. Uh, and then he left. And then after that, I kept going at the workshop after workshop after workshop. <laughs> you know, from from a seven day to twenty one day to forty day to one hundred and twenty day, all in a row. <laughs> Others did not do that. Others they would you know um, there would be a forty day workshop and then uh, they would all go out uh, fundraising or whatever and then and then a, a new group of uh, people would come in for the next forty day workshop and so forth. Um, but I was kept behind always because. Uh, uh, they, need, they, they needed someone who, who could uh, translate uh, uh, Japanese to English. Uh, that was a, a valuable task at that time because uh, there, were, there were very few Koreans in the United States then. It was a time when the Korean government was restricting overseas travel. And so most of the leaders in, in America were Japanese and so the Japanese were having you no know, language problems. So they kept me behind. Uh, so I wound up going through this a series of workshops like that. And then um, um, the second time I saw Father was um, uh, not long after that. I think around that time, maybe not, or not long, maybe you know, less than a month after that, where Father came to Berrytown to uh, speak, and uh, uh, everyone gathered. There, you know, there were hundreds of people gathered there in the main uh, auditorium, there, the main lecture hall that held uh, how many? I don't know, how, a few hundred people. I don't know, hundreds of people anyway. That was where all the big workshops were given and um, uh, I don't remember much of what he said except that except for one point he said what would you do <clears throat> of course at this time I didn't understand Korean so when I was listening to the to the English translation where well, I don't remember who was translating what would you do if you were out in the snow there's no cover no trees no cover no houses no cover you're just out in the snow how are you going to keep from freezing to death? How are you going to stay warm? How are you going to survive? Uh, and um, there's everyone, uh, of course, much later in um, my experience with Father, uh, an older member advised me, um, when Father asks us a question, the best thing to do is don't answer. Because <laughs> he said, two things can happen. He says, um, well, if you answer, he says, whatever, you answer, whatever answer you give is going to be wrong. <laughs> if you don't answer, he says, if you're lucky, he'll just pass over and, 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 uh, and, and let you go and, and go on to something else. But, you know, various people were trying to answer this question, I think. And, of course, they were all wrong. And finally, uh, he gave his answer. He said, uh, you pray. You pray hard. <laughs> you pray so hard that you begin to sweat. <laughs> That's how you stay warm in a, in a place where you have, in a, in a, in a snowy plain, uh, where you have no, uh, no cover of any kind, no trees, no houses, no, no rocks or anything. Uh, you just pray, pray as hard as you can until you sweat. That's the one point that I remember from, from his speech uh, about, around then. Um, but I also want to talk about, uh, uh, I think, hearing the divine principle is also one encounter with Father. And you know, it, it's the it's the word of God, and actually, um, it's probably the most more important uh, encounter because uh, uh, this is not a personality cult. Uh, as we uh, follow Father because of the um, uh, word that He brings and the uh, and uh, the salvation that He brings. And I was um, uh, uh, living in. Um, uh, Nyack, 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 New York. That's just uh, across the Hudson River from uh, Terrytown. At that time, it was a very small village, a very small town. I noticed today they have a big shopping mall and everything, huge, but it wasn't anything like that back then. And I was renting a room, an upstairs room in someone's home, uh, because I had been uh, hired to do some sales work for a um, uh, a global uh, pharmaceutical company. I was I was an employee of their American uh, subsidiary. They wanted to. They said they were going to put me through a, a training course to become a uh, take an executive position in their Japanese branch to to um, uh, be kind of intermediary between or a connection between their Japanese branch and the headquarters in in Europe. 
so anyway, uh, I was living there, and and um, um, uh, I always tried to keep out of Manhattan, as I really didn't like the whole environment. But but I felt that I needed to uh, do some research down at the the um, public library. So I went there one Saturday, and um, I went into the library, but they didn't have the materials that I was looking for. And so I came out the the um, exit onto 42nd Street of the New York Public Library and and this um, uh, tiny young lady comes up to me and and um, uh, says to me hello uh, she's uh, she says hello my name is Hiroko uh, in English <laughs> and I was surprised because I had seen these Asian people you know this was uh, uh, around the time of uh, Madison Square Garden September 18th was Madison Square Garden I think and this is so this is a, a couple of weeks after that and of course father's picture was everywhere on all the you know construction sites it were plastered with father's picture and everything like that and i had seen also these these asian people uh you know handing out flowers and stuff like that uh, uh or materials and, and soliciting people to go to madison square garden and uh but i had paid no attention to them because i figured they were korean and uh, if there was one thing that I learned in Japanese public school, is that uh, uh, you don't bother Koreans. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, anyway, uh, this was the education that I had received in Japanese public school. So I had avoided them actually. But this woman comes up to me and says, my name is Hiroko. And so I, uh, so I uh, uh, answered her, oh. I answered her in Japanese. I said, oh, you're Japanese, because I recognized from her name that she was Japanese. And so then uh, she grabbed my wrist. She grabbed my wrist. <laughs> and um, um, took me to, to where her team was, uh, about a block or so away, because she had been, you know, sometime before that, after Madison Square Garden, uh, father had told, uh, apparently, had told uh, her and others that um, they needed to uh, witness to more white men, Caucasian men. Not that father, you know, was racist, but, you know, it's, if he wants to move America, he realized that he had to have uh, Caucasian men, because those are the ones that were, Caucasian men were basically running the country then. And uh, uh, so she, she was young and she couldn't speak English. And uh, so she prayed to God and said, God, if you want me to w witness to a Caucasian man, then you're going to have to give me, lead me to a Caucasian man who speaks Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she fasted seven days uh, to meet a Caucasian man who speaks Japanese. Wow. Uh, God. <laughs> and this was the day after her fast ended. And of course, everyone around her was tol telling her that she was foolish. You know, her um, uh, center leader uh, was telling her, you know, if you have time to fast, you should uh, study English instead, and everything like that. And uh, and even on that day, um, um, they had been witnessing around that exit uh, on 42nd Street, but then a little bit before I came, uh, the rest of the team decided, no, we're not going to have any result here. Let's move over to another, another location. But she uh, decided, she insisted to stay behind. Uh, and so I think she and maybe one or two others were the only ones there. So, yeah, when I, when I spoke to her in Japanese, uh, she grabbed my wrist and she wasn't going to let go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, um, well, today she's uh, uh, Mrs. Kaufman, so <laughs> uh, Frank Kaufman's wife, Hiroko Kaufman. Um, but... Uh, it was a, uh, an amazing thing that, that happened that day. And, and uh, uh, I, I had time, I guess, because I had not found the materials that I really wanted in the, in the public library and I had nothing else to do on that. On that. This was a Saturday. Um, and, you know, I had parked, parked my car in one of these parking garages or something. And so uh, it turned out, though, that the only place where I could receive the principal that day was at their church in Flushing which, if you know New York, is not very...
close to uh, Midtown Manhattan. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a distance from Midtown, Midtown Manhattan on, on the subway. So anyway, she took me all the way out to Flushing and uh, I heard the uh, principal creation then for the first time. Uh, but I didn't absorb any of it. All I remember was, you know, these circles and these lines going everywhere and everything like that. And they also didn't have anyone who could give it to me in English. So they had, they had someone, a, a Japanese sister, I think, an older Japanese sister, uh, lectured to me. But uh, it may as well have been in English. I, I, I didn't, or French or Swahili or whatever. Because I, I, all I remember is just the circles and the lines and uh, arrows and stuff like that. Um, and uh, uh, and the next day was a Sunday, and I was actually attending a Presbyterian church then, in uh, somewhere in the Nyack area. And uh, the next day, I was actually supposed to do something there. I was uh, on Sunday. I had joined that church in September, and they had a choir, but um, uh, well. I was the tenor section. <laughs> and the next day we were going to sing a, a song where only the tenor section was going to sing a certain part of the, of the music, you know. And so I couldn't exactly miss that because it was basically, not that I wanted it, but it was basically a tenor solo. <laughs> so, so they wanted me to come back the next day, but I said, well, you know, I have this commitment and so far. So. So I'm walking out the door, and, and of course she's absolutely certain that she's never going to see me again. And so as I'm walking out the door, uh, she um, uh, was sort of trying to get something, some kind of hook into me. And and uh, one thing she said sort of stuck to me, and that is, uh, she said, "Why why did Jesus come when he did? Why didn't he Why didn't he come earlier? Have you ever thought of that, or something like that, something to an extent?" And I thought to myself, well, that's an interesting question. Because I've never asked that question before. And we assume that, and I think a lot of Christians today just assume, okay, Jesus came when he did. They don't ask, you know, why did he come at that particular moment in time, in particular moment in history? Um, why couldn't he have come earlier uh, or later? Or why that particular time? And so I think that um, uh, interested me a lot. And so the next day after... Uh, church service at the Presbyterian Church, I, I drove back uh, to Flushing and uh, uh, I heard the, uh, um, uh, the second chapter. <clears throat> and that was fine, but then then she wanted me to go to Berrytown. And, and I was, it was nice, you know, to meet Japanese people. I'd been in America for a while. I missed Japan, missed Japanese people. It was nice to be around Japanese people. They were nice people and everything like that. But going someplace upstate for some kind of a workshop, that seemed to cross the line a bit. <laughs> I didn't really need that. And so I kept uh, refusing and, and refusing. And, but uh, one day, you know, before, you know, we didn't have cell phones in those days. It was all landlines. And I guess I gave her my, my phone number. So she called the, the house where I was living and uh, she was in tears. She was absolutely in tears. The next weekend, by the way, was you know Columbus Day weekend. She was in tears. So I said, okay. I'm not going to sacrifice the whole long weekend, but I'll go for two days. You know, not three days, just two days. Well, the policy, as it turned out, I learned later, was that uh, anyone who would only commit to two days was rejected. <laughs> So she went to, I don't know, probably Mr. Kamiyama or somebody, and she probably cried again there. <laughs> um, but anyway, they accepted me for two days. And this was also the weekend of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the banquet in Washington, D.C., the, the Day of Hope banquet in Washington, D.C., which she was involved in. And so she was down in Washington, D.C. And then on, on um, Saturday, I guess, um, of that long weekend, I think she she got someone uh, to drive her all the way from Washington D.C. to Barrytown uh, to come up and, and convince me to stay. Uh, but um, uh, by the time that she arrived, I had already decided to stay. And um, uh, when I first when I first heard chapter one, I thought, okay, up in Barrytown, I had a, I had a different experience with the principal in Barrytown. Um, uh, 
and um, after chapter one, I thought, okay, well, these are this is uh, something that I can use in my life. These these are good uh, things to live by, and I can probably improve my 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 life, my relationships with people by by practicing the things that I've learned in this particular lecture. Uh, but I think in, uh, things started getting serious in, in chapter two with the fall, uh, and um, I gradually began to realize that uh, that that Father was in fact the returning Messiah. And, um, and so I think uh, um, by the time I was, uh, they were giving the uh, lecture on the second coming, the last uh, chapter, I, was, uh, I, I knew what they were saying before they would say it. Um, and so I called my boss, who was a Catholic, an Irish Catholic, and told him, I've, well, I've um, met this group that says that the Messiah has returned and I'd, and I'd like to investigate it more, so I'd like to have more time off. And actually, Columbus Day was not supposed to be a vacation for me. This, this, uh, this particular company didn't give uh, time off for a vacation. It was a European company. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyway, so he said, okay, well, he said, okay, well, you're young and, and uh, you have to uh, decide which direction you're going to go. And he asked, uh, so if you decide that this is in fact all true, are you going to quit? And I said, yeah, I probably will. <laughs> and so he said, okay, well, and then, yeah, and so anyway, I um, uh, stayed there um, uh, for, well, for a while and then wound up, of course, uh, quitting the company. Um, the, my, my experience with fathers uh, over the years, um, both uh, sort of directly and, and indirectly through his word and and through the providence was always uh, uh, deeply moving. With Father, uh, Father had the whole range of emotions. You know, he was loving and kind, uh, sometimes in tears. Uh, he would often pray in tears. Uh, sometimes he'd be angry, and when he was angry, he was uh, sometimes very angry. Um, I don't know if I really experienced Father's real anger, uh, but I've heard Sort of uh, stories from older members. Uh, one that I remember is that um, in one of the matching sessions in, in Korea, one of the earlier ones, I guess, uh, where the father discovered, and the story is that he discovered this spiritually, that an angel came and told him, or when he discovered spiritually that um, someone was there who didn't belong there, uh, who had not fulfilled the conditions that Father had had, uh, had set aside for people to, to, to fulfill in order to, to um, uh, participate in this uh, matching. And so he became extremely angry and, and uh, started, he, the person was you know, sitting on the floor and Father was standing up and he started kicking the person in and the person was sort of move away from Father in order to avoid the kicks and Father would move forward and kick him and he kicked him all the way out the door, all the way through the, through the hall and all the way out the door because his anger was so uh, so intense uh, at that moment. Uh, and Father was uh, um, very uncompromising when it came to um, people or things that um, violated or undermined uh, uh, Father uh, God's uh, providence or or the uh, the progress towards that. And so, for example, you know when he would talk about homosexuality, it was a very he would talk about it in very extreme terms. Uh, uh, things like you know um, uh, quarantining them on an island or st stuff like that, um, but he was always very um, uh, he was always very loving those to those though who repented and, and you know the fact is that that father did uh, bless uh, people who were homosexual, although he blessed them in heterosexual marriages uh, so he didn't actually quarantine them. <laughs> so, and he didn't say, oh, you're, hetero, you're homosexual, therefore I, I'm not going to allow you to participate in the blessing. If a homosexual person could, uh, could uh, repent or, or understand that this was uh, against God's providence and, and um, work to make a heterosexual marriage work, uh, then uh, he, would, uh, he would give that person uh, the holy blessing. Uh, and I think there were, there were a number of cases um, uh, like that. Um, 
I, I actually, you know, people think that I often translate it for Father, but uh, and that's that's true in a sense. But I only have one experience um, where I was actually on stage with Father in front of a large audience, and that was when Father came to uh, Washington D.C. Uh, to celebrate the, uh, to commemorate the anniversary, I think, of the purchase of the uh, Columbia Road Church, I, th I believe, and. <clears throat> For some reason, the leaders there, the Koreans there, decided to sort of uh, maneuver things and maneuver Father into appointing me as his, as his uh, translator for that day. I'm not really sure why. But the, uh, the, the, the story was that, oh, there are a lot of Japanese here, so Father, why don't you speak in Japanese? And then this guy here can translate your Japanese into English. That was kind of the story that was, that was given anyway. And so uh, I was uh, called up on stage and father looked at me and he said, the first thing he said, first thing he said, I don't like people who are taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally froze. <laughs> and literally my, my, my mind became just like a, a blank sheet of paper. And I couldn't speak. I couldn't speak. <laughs> and the Koreans are tugging me. You know, where the, I'm on the stage, and they're, and they're sort of tugging my pants. You got to translate what Father just said, you know. But <laughs> and I could hear them saying that, but I could not get my mouth to move. I could not get. I could not force words to come out of my mouth. <laughs> but Father, but when when Father does that kind of a thing, um, what he was doing is uh, sort of separating Satan from a person. Um, uh, he's, he was really, really, uh, you know, rebooted me, basically. <laughs> rebooted me so that all the sort of the viruses and, and, uh, and uh, uh, these uh, malware and stuff, everything like that, just sort of uh, uh, gets, uh, gets chased out or something, you know, so because, um, uh, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, but one experience I always wanted to have is I was watching people like Bohi Pak translate for Father and stuff like that, and others translate the fathers that at some point in his speech he would often turn to his translator and start, you know, knocking them on the head. <laughs> and I wanted that experience. <laughs> and sure enough, we were going along, and uh, uh, Father suddenly turns to me with his, with his fist raised, <laughs> and I thought, praise God, here we go. And so I closed my eyes and I leaned into it. <laughs> I closed my eyes and I leaned into it and I waited and I waited and I waited and it didn't come. <laughs> so I opened my eyes and he's always he's already walking the other <laughs> he's walking away from me. Ah <laughs> Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> that would have been a, a wonderful thing to happen. Uh, but uh, uh, he chose not to knock me on the head. Uh, maybe because he had already sort of rebooted me once. He didn't think I, he had to reboot me again. I don't know why. But I, was, <laughs> but I was leaning down. I was leaning into it. He knew you wanted it, so he didn't give it to you. <laughs> maybe I wanted it too much. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, uh, and um, anyway, during that speech, uh, he found one point where I was able to do a, a pretty good job of translating, and so he kept repeating that one point over and over and over again, and, and doing it over and over again. You know, so this one um, sort of diagram that he sometimes would use, uh, sort of the upper arc and the lower arc, uh, uh, front, back, top, bottom. And it happened that uh, uh, Dong Wenju had just explained this to me just a few days before, and so I had a pretty good idea of uh, what he was talking about. Um, so father, father lashed onto that, but yeah, he he knew me very well. He knew me, uh, and he knew my capability very well. But the thing is that he was supposed to, you know, like I say, the the he's supposed to speak in Japanese, so I would translate into English. But he kept slipping into Korean the whole time, and um, Hak Chahan was there sitting down there, saying, and she she would continually try, you know, say, hey, you're supposed to be speaking in Japanese, and stop speaking in Korean. You're supposed to be speaking in Japanese. <laughs> but anyway, um, I was able to translate the Korean as well. Now, when I first joined the Unification Church, uh, I didn't know any Korean. I had never seen a Korean character. 
I never um, had any experience with the Korea or a Korean language or anything like that. I didn't know how to say hello in Korean. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I'm sure all of you know uh, considerably more Korean than I knew uh, when I first joined in 74. And then when I was in uh, UTS, uh, the final semester, I guess, so it must have been the spring of 77, a class was offered in Korean, and I thought, well, you know, who knows, uh, it might come in handy someday. And so uh, I walked in there, and I actually, for some reason, walked in there a day late. And everybody else already knew how to count to 10. Now, <laughs> wait a second, you know, I'm already, I'm already way behind here. Uh, so uh, anyway, they, um, Mr. Pyun uh, taught us uh, um, a few things. Uh, he taught us how to say the final stanza of, uh, not family pledge, but my pledge at that time. Um, and uh, he would make fun of us because we couldn't, we couldn't uh, pronounce the name of our church in Korean uh, correctly. Uh, in other words, uh, we couldn't say Tong Yu Kyohe. Uh, we would, everybody was pronouncing it incorrectly. He said, you can't even pronounce the name of your own church. Uh, he was not a member. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that was uh, my first experience with Korean, and um, uh, when I went to when I got to Korea in um, four years later, I guess well, I guess the, not four years after I joined in, in 1978. Um, no one knew that I was arriving, and so no one came to the airport to greet me. And, but I knew enough Korean that I could go to the uh, telephone book and I could look up the name of the, of the church and find the telephone number. And so I did that and I was supposed to meet someone named Reverend Lee. And I always thought, you know, how many Lees can there be in Korea? You know, <laughs> I, I didn't know anything about Korea. Like you all know much more about Korea than I knew then. How many Lees can there be in Korea? I mean, there not, I'm sure the number of Reverend Lees in Korea, probably, you know, maybe five at the most. <laughs> so I called the number uh, in the phone book, and, um, and it turned out to be the, the uh, phone number of the headquarters church. And uh, actually, the, the head of the headquarters church at that time was a, a Reverend Lee, but not the Reverend Lee that I was supposed to meet. But anyway, um, they couldn't speak English, and I couldn't speak Korean, so that didn't work out so well. But finally, I, I um, uh, got in touch with the man that I, that I needed to, to get in touch with. Um, and then, I guess at the end of uh, October, um, Father uh, gathered um, a few hundred people in a stingney to, to match us. And um, he uh, came in with a, with, with, a, with a stack of photographs, you know, and these were state leaders in America. These were, these were important people in America. People like, uh, you know, Tom McDevitt was there and, and a whole bunch of other really, you know, important people in America and the American movement were there. And then me and about, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 uh, Westerners were off here to the side of the stage. And he um, looked at it, and of course, you know, there's all brothers on one side and all sisters on the other side. And he looked at the sisters and says, uh, said, who wants to be matched with a, with a Western man? Um, and, and a bunch of them hold, held up their hands, and he said, okay, we'll come up from the stage. And I think maybe about 50 uh, uh, sisters uh, got up, maybe, maybe, maybe less, but maybe about 50 sisters got up and came on stage. And my wife, uh, Nosek, was one of them. Um, I'd never seen her. I still, at that point, I didn't know who she was. And um, um, so he started going through the photographs. And I looked at that stack and looked at the number of sisters. And I thought, mm, this is going to be this is going to be pretty close if he does all those photographs before he comes to us. Um, uh, but then at one point he, he put down the photographs and he came over and uh, actually he pointed to the, to the brother behind me. I know his name, but anyway. And asked him, how old are you? And he answered, and I think he was a year older than me. 
And then um, he said, okay, well, then pointed at me and says, how old are you? And I told him, and then in each time, uh, you know, he stood up and answered, and I stood up and answered. And after answering, you know, you're sitting on the floor, and so when you're six feet, uh, at that time I was six feet two, it takes a while to go back down, you know, <laughs> to go back, come back, come up and go back down. This takes, takes some time. So by the time I, I'm sitting down, I look up, and, and Father has this sister by the, by, by the wrist, and he's uh, pulling her across the stage. And as he's coming, he, he motions for me to, to get up. And so I, I get back up, and, and like I said, it takes some time. And so, and so by the time I got up and I look over, she's already bowing. <laughs> so the first thing I saw of her was, was, the, was the top of her head. And, you know, I was raised right, and so when someone bows to me, I bow back, right? <laughs> so I bow back and everybody claps. <laughs> Not thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I haven't even seen her face yet. <laughs> but anyway, that was that. <laughs> so, you know, uh, then we went into this side room and, and um, of course I didn't, you know, I spoke maybe, uh, you know, just a, a little bit of Korean that I had learned at UTS and uh, so forth. Uh, so she did, you know, they, we had us writing our names down, stuff like that. And we were actually about, uh, I think, number 12, actually. And then we went out uh, onto the, uh, um, that sort of a, f uh, sort of the exercise field area that was next to the workshop center and sat and then one brother, uh, 1800 couple brother who spoke English came along to translate for us. And uh, she said, uh, well, um, do you have any questions? I said, yeah, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> And so then she uh, wrote her name for me, and I said, well, well, how do you write it in Chinese characters? And she wrote that, but she was also curious. Why, why, why would you ask me about the Chinese characters? I mean, how, how would you know Chinese characters in the first place? <laughs> and so then, uh, uh, you know, started talking you know, about uh, my experience in Japan and so forth, uh, sort of getting to, getting to know each other that way. Um, but uh, from, from uh, that time on, um, I was much more motivated than to, to start learning Korean. And she went out pioneer witnessing, uh, I guess about six weeks after that, to an area, you know, to an island off the southern coast. Or actually, you no, know, first she went to another area in, uh, anyway, in the southern, south, southeastern part of Korea. And in those days, it was very difficult even to call from Seoul down to Busan. Um, even, I think, young Koreans would not be able to imagine how it was back then, where you had to call a, a special long-distance operator. And there was a different operator for each province. And you would call the operator, and you would say, okay, this is the number that I'm trying to reach. And um, then you would hang up the phone and wait for the operator to call you back. And it would, it would take maybe half an hour or so or something like that. And then after that, then they would call you back, and then you'd be able to talk to that person down in Busan. Uh, so it was, it was very difficult to, to communicate, and so uh, we would um, uh, we we agreed to write letters to each other. And uh, I said, okay, I'll, I'll write you in English, and and you write me in Korean. And uh, so that's what we did, and and we promised to write each other once a week, and I think we we did at least that. Actually, more probably an average of quite substantially more than that, um, writing each other. And you know, the first time I got her letter, I made a huge mistake. I took it to the office and said, "You know, will someone help me translate this letter?" <laughs> One of the biggest mistakes of my life, <laughs> because the letter got passed around the office. <laughs> Oh, isn't this so cute? You know. Oh, look, they're in love with each other. Oh, you know. Oh, she sings these things about you. So right then and there, I said, "Okay, I don't care if it kills me. I'm never doing that again. <laughs> I'm going to figure this out on my own." And I just say, you know, any language that was created by human beings can be deciphered by another human being. That was. I just made that decision. And uh, of course, it was. Number one, it was difficult to read her handwriting because I had learned Korean from a textbook, you know. Yeah. And the, the printed Korean is very different from handwritten Korean. 
And so when I first looked at the letter, I said, well, wait a second, what is this? You know, this doesn't look like anything I've learned or have studied. You know? uh, but uh, uh, I got myself a, a dictionary and, and it was uh, sometimes extremely frustrating. Sometimes I would literally be rolling around on the floor in frustration trying to figure this thing out. Um, but uh, uh, eventually I, I began to do so and, and, you know, and also I was going to Sunday services and sitting through the Sunday services not understanding anything for about uh, three years. Uh, but then after three years, you know, um, um, sort of the fog began to clear, I would say, in, in, the, in, sport, in terms of the spoken Korean, in terms of understanding in my ear becoming more accustomed to, to spoken Korean. And uh, I was also learning more uh, written Korean and the reading ability from her letters and also from um, reading the the newspapers um, trying to read the newspapers and in those days uh, Korean newspapers had a lot of uh, Chinese characters in them and today they don't but in, the, in that time they did and and that helped me because you know I knew that the Chinese characters from my experience in Japan and so uh, gradually I was able to uh, increase my vocabulary and and understand uh, more of the grammar and after after a while then she was actually in in uh, her pioneer mission for uh, three full years uh, and I only went down to visit her I think once uh, during those three years so uh, at, at one point we said I said okay let's switch I'll write you in Korean and you write me in English and then you can correct my Korean and send it back to me, and I'll correct your English and send it back to you. Um, and so we did that for a while. And um, funny story is that uh, she saved all these letters, you know, in a in a folder, in a, in a you know, with the plastic uh, the plastic sh uh, sleeves. And one day, many years later, we were living in Virginia in a house. Uh, in, in, in Virginia and all of a sudden you know we had by that time we had three kids and all of a sudden we hear this this cackling laughter coming from the basement <laughs> so our daughters had come across these letters <laughs> that my wife had saved and uh, they were having a great time over them <laughs> but it was good you know it was good to, to, that they found those letters and, and were able to uh, see how our relationship uh, began but Father brought us together like that, um, and uh, one of my one of our daughters tried to come up with a conspiracy theory one time that because my wife and I were were, were obviously so well matched together, her theory was that even if we had not joined the church, we would have somehow met. That somehow the universe would have brought us together. <laughs> but I said no, no. That's because. Honestly, uh, if I had not joined the Unification Church, I would have not have had any interest or desire uh, to understand or know about Korea. Um, I don't know what I would have done. It probably, you know, I would have continued my job there and, and I would have uh, uh, maybe continued to work for this pharmaceutical company in Japan uh, and perhaps in Europe. And um, uh, I would never have uh, had any interest in, in Korea or learning Korean. Um, so it really was the father that, that brought us together. Um, she has reminded me sometimes that uh, she is the only woman in the uh, only woman in the world who can stand to live with me, <laughs> and I acknowledge that is true. <laughs> but it was father's uh, great uh, uh, genius and des uh, genius that uh, uh, great work to to uh, pick her out of the universe uh, and uh, help us uh, to to meet each other, allow us to meet each other uh, there. Um, I really love uh, studying and, re and reading uh, Father's words uh, because there's so much uh, to learn and uh, so many levels uh, that you can understand. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, people will not be satisfied with the translations. Um, if I'm elected to the uh, Congress of the um, uh, Guk, I'm going to propose a law. <laughs> I'm going to propose a law that anyone who begins a sentence with Father said, without being able to understand Father in Korean, gets serious jail time. Oh 
Because if you're reading Father in translation, you don't know what he said. You have some general idea of what he said. Uh, but I really think that, um, um, that people need to uh, approach Father in Korean in order to, in order to uh, uh, understand him. Uh, and unfortunately, the translations that have been done, done until now, many of them were done in such a haste that uh, there are mistakes. And partly because of, uh, you know, many reasons, partly because the person doing the translation uh, was uh, still developing their understanding of principle and, and the Father's teachings. And that's also true because a person can only translate up to the level that they understand Father's teachings. So if you're relying on that person's uh, translation, then, then that's the limit to which you can reach. You can't go beyond that. Uh, so if you're reading a translation that someone six months in the church uh, created, then you're understanding Father at that level of six months in the church, of six months studying Father's, uh, Father's teachings. And, you know, uh, as I go through the uh, Chun Sung Gyeong recently, I really hadn't compared the English and, and Korean Chun Sung Gyeongs uh, so much because I always figured, uh, well, why would I even bother with the English Chun Sung Gyeong? I have the Korean, I'll just use the Korean, but because of a King's Report, I've had the opportunity to sort of uh, uh, compare the two because what I do is, for the Rima, I'll first go to the Korean and pick the Rima from the Korean and then I'll find the equivalent translation in the English. And since I have them both open, I, I tend to compare the two. And, and, and if you've been listening and watching the King's Report, you know that you know, often I find uh, errors and sometimes there are very serious errors. Sometimes they are not just, uh, not just a person's uh, limit of, limitation of the understanding, but sometimes there are deliberate uh, changes in Father's words, kind of tone down uh, Father's words. You know, the example that, uh, that Jesus Montenegro in, 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 in Japan pointed out to us was that, uh, you know, where the Korean says uh, something to the effect of um, if it becomes necessary to draw your sword uh, in order to protect uh, heavenly traditions, then you have to have the guts to draw your sword. But that's not what the English says. It says something to the effect of uh, if, if, it if it becomes necessary to take a strong stand, in order to protect the uh, traditions of heaven, then you have to be able to take a strong stand. <laughs> that has to be deliberate. You know, that's not a limitation of someone's understanding. That has to be, oh, wait, wait, we don't, we, 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 we don't want Father to, to be shown as being uh, that kind of a militaristic person, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, well, that one really, um, really uh, caught me. Because apparently the Spanish translation has it has it more accurately. The Spanish translation apparently Jesus said the the reason he contacted me because he noticed that there was a difference between the Spanish and the English. Well, the Spanish said sword and the and the English said strong stand. So he was asking me which is correct. Uh, and and I looked at the Korean and, and the one with sword is correct. Um, uh, you know and and and. Some of the older Koreans would uh, sometimes uh, complain that, um, you know, these uh, translations that were created, sometimes the translations were cr created by committee. In other words, that was part of this, a few of these committees where um, maybe I would create a draft and then a committee of um, five, six, seven or eight people would come together and, and discuss it and propose changes. And... Um, uh, I think they finally they finally stopped inviting me to be part of those committees because I I rejected so many of those of their suggestions. But you know you have to stay true to the original, right? Yeah. And they would propose changes that would improve the English, but I felt went for, went took it away from the Korean. But still, some of the older Koreans would complain that uh, we were making father into uh, someone who sounded like an Anglo-Saxon. And they, they said, well, you're taking away his Koreanness, And I think that, that's probably true with the, sort of the prepared speeches that he would give at uh, banquets and so forth. Uh, so uh, someone might say, well, I guess the Chun Song Gyeong has to be retrans retranslated, but <laughs> I don't think so. I think uh, just people just have to, pe people just have to go and, and um, I hate to say this, but you got to learn Korean. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to say that. You don't hate to say that. I don't hate to say that. <laughs> well, I... I know people don't like to hear it. <laughs> but that is, the, that is the truth, I'm afraid. Um, 
yeah there is a there's a gold mine out there and um, uh, people need to to understand uh, uh, the value of that of course even Korean does not uh, reflect a uh, father's um, teachings fully as no human language can fully reflect uh, God's truth can fully uh, do that and I, I feel that father is a, was a translator uh, it was his job to translate that sort of truth you know that is out there into a human language um, and of course Korean was prepared for that purpose but still it comes out of the um, out of the cultural context of fallen history and so forth and so even though it is uh, we could sp say the least bad among all human languages in terms of being able to receive God's truth uh, still it's it's uh, uh, not nearly uh, adequate to express God's uh, uh, teachings and uh, God's uh, message uh, fully um, uh, and, and, you know like uh, to give the example for example the love you know or sarang uh, that's a word that we use and people use in Korean but what does father mean by sarang or, or by love uh, we don't know because we've never experienced the kind of love that uh, father is talking about and he talks about a kind of love that where he compares it to a uh, a bee a honeybee who is a, a honeybee that is sucking the nectar out of a flower and he said you can grab that honeybee by the by the behind and pull on it and it will not let go of that flower uh, even if even if uh, uh, you separate the bottom part in other words even if you kill the bee in that way even at the cost of its life it's not going to let go of that flower uh, in his words he says well that's that that dis that, that describes uh, that describes a god's love that once you experience it then you're, you're never going to let go even at the cost of your life well we've never experienced that kind of love we don't we don't have the capability our sin prevents us from from really fully experiencing god's love in that way so even father uses the word uh, sarang uh, we don't really understand what what father uh, is meaning by that um, uh, and that can only be understood by by experiencing uh, his love uh, uh, to greater and greater depths which we which we can do uh, through our through our daily lives and through our prayer and through our experiences yeah mm. I think uh, uh, I'm sure everybody who experienced father directly misses him tremendously because he was a, a source of that kind of love a great love uh, I think he, he gave a look the kind of love that uh, people could not find any place else a lot of people came to the church and then left, uh, but I suspect that they all remember um, the love that they experienced in the church. And they're out there, and, and um, uh, I hope that they can know that uh, his, uh, the second king is continuing uh, his work and, uh, and is um, uh, beginning to build uh, God's kingdom. Something that Lisa Ellenson said on the King's Report just a couple of days ago really inspired me. She said, uh, we're no longer living in the last days. We're living in the first days. <laughs> yeah, that really inspired me. Uh, yeah, that's that's really true, and uh, I really can't wait to see uh, how the world is going to change over the next ten years, or fifty years, or a hundred years. And I'm sure that uh, something very beautiful is going to be built. I feel like I'm coming to an end. <laughs> what time is it? Six fifty-five. Oh my goodness, I thought I'd only spoken for about 20 minutes. Uh, I, keep, I keep thinking, oh, I've got to speak longer, you know, because I haven't, you know, I haven't filled the time. But I guess uh, the time has come. Okay, well, great. Thank you very much. Praise God.